Hi, my name's Andy, uh, and this is a video about um, how uh, to implement some very simple security in a REST API. Uh, we've been making a REST API in the last few videos. Um, part of my interest, or the main reason for my interest in uh, working out all this stuff, was to get onto the topic of how to do security. Uh, and this is the easy bit, um, and then in later videos we'll talk about some of the other ways of doing it. So we'll quickly look at what we've done already, uh, what our goals are for security in this system, um, what the architecture is, we'll look at some of the options of how you can do it and we'll look a bit more closely at HTTP Digest and HTTP Basic and then we'll look at the code of how we've done it. And if you look at the blog post link from the show notes um, there's a link to the code uh, which you can look at for yourself. So first of all what are we doing? Well what we're doing is we're making a kind of YouTube uh, but for poems instead of videos. Um, it's going to be big um, and we're, the way we're approaching making this website is we're writing the API uh, before we write any of the actual websites so that um, we make sure that we get it right, we get it factored right so that we can use the same set of functionality to build the website as uh, other people use uh, to use our API. Uh, at the moment our API allows people to get hold of poems and modify poems that are already in the system and add new ones. Uh, we can list poems and we can search for poems. Uh, we've done those in previous videos and have a look back uh, if you want to look at that. Uh, and today uh, we're going to be looking at security. So what are our goals for security of this um, this poem website or the API of this poem website? Uh, well firstly anyone ought to be able to find poems and read them uh, they shouldn't have to log in to be able to do that. Also anyone should be able to add a poem uh, but I've decided um, we need to know who they are to be able to add a poem. Um, they have to log in, they have to get themselves a login and log in. Um, part of the reason for that is because once they've uploaded that poem they then own it and uh, can modify it later and we don't want just anyone to be able to modify it. Um, yeah, so the final point is you can only modify or delete poems that you uploaded. Uh, fairly straightforward. Okay, so how does the architecture of this work? How does it all fit together? Well, um, we start at the top uh, and there's a person using the API. And there are two basic layers of security we need to think about. One is called authentication and one is called authorization. Uh, authentication basically means finding out who someone is and authorization means finding out what they're allowed to do because of who they are. So um, we have a number of um, different uh, uh, actions we can do through our REST API. Um, and they have these different names, put, post, patch, delete and get, which we covered in previous videos. And you'll notice that uh, the different actions you can do go through different security layers. So all the actions like put, post, patch and delete, everything except get, goes through this um, thick uh, authentication layer near the top. What I mean by that um, is that in order to do any of those actions, you have to be a person, a logged in person that we know who you are. Um, because those are doing actions to um, poems that exist or they're making new poems and in either case we've decided we want uh, to know who you are if you're going to do that. And then the get action on the far right is a bit different. Uh, that goes through a thinner layer of authentication which basically means if if you are logged in we want to know who you are but you can also not be logged in if you want and then who you are is the anonymous person. Um, but we will make use of the information about who you are if you are logged in. Um, okay, and then uh, once we've got through that authentication layer and established who you are, um, several of the actions also need to know uh, that you are a specific person allowed to do this particular action. And that specific person depends on which poem you're working with. Uh, that stage is called authorization. You can see that the put, patch and delete actions need to check that you're the person who uh, contributed this poem uh, before you're allowed to... Um, replace it, modify it or delete it. You'll notice that the post action doesn't care who you are. Once it knows that you're someone, it's happy. Um, and the get action really doesn't care who you are. Even if you're anonymous, uh, it lets you get a poem and read it. So two phases really to the whole thing. Authentication, who are you? Authorization, are you allowed to do that? Okay, so there are a lot of options for how we could provide security in our API. Um, two main categories. You can either store and manage a list of um, usernames and passwords or equivalent 
that you want to that you manage and three three sort of areas and uh, ways you could do that number one you could use http basic authentication number two you could use http digest authentication number three you could get them to log in and then once they've logged in you could store a security token in a cookie um, there are also other ways um, of doing it where someone else holds on to the list of usernames and passwords and you just kind of piggyback on them um, the main ones that I'm going to try and cover in these videos are OpenID and OAuth uh, but for this video we're only covering HTTP Basic and a tiny bit about HTTP Digest so uh, what is HTTP Basic? Well basically what it means is that as part of each HTTP request that you make through our API um, you can send a username and a password and they're passed in plain texts. They're not they're not immediately readable to a human, but they're extremely easily readable to a human if you manage the request a bit, uh, and very easily readable to a machine. Um, so that sounds crazy. Of course, it's not crazy because if you're using HTTPS, if your server is only talking in HTTPS, that means no one can listen in. So um, they're 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 passed in clear text. As far as the application is concerned, but as far as anyone trying to listen is concerned, um, they can't see them. So it's perfectly reasonable to use HTTP basic authentication so long as you're using an HTTPS session. If you weren't using an HTTPS session, anyone who ran any of the web servers that happened to be passed through on the way between um, the user and the server would be able to find out your username and password every time you made a request. So that wouldn't be very reasonable. But if you're using HTTPS, no one can listen in like that. Um, unless there's a bug in the HTTPS implementation, obviously. Uh, so uh, things about HTTP basic authentication. Well, it's easy to test out in the browser. If you if you type in one of our API URLs in the browser, um, we will it will the browser will pop up a username and password um, dialog box if we're using HTTP basic authentication and you can type in your username and password and then it'll let you carry on. Only thing about um, this is that it's quite in a browser it's quite hard to um, uh, get the browser to forget your username and password if you want to try out being different various different people uh, it's hard to get the browser to forget who you are and different browsers have different ways of doing it and it's not very standard which can be annoying. Anyway, you probably won't be using the browser, but it's nice to explore an API the first time you use it by using a browser. Uh, here's how you do it with curl, which is um, the, the tool we've been using to check how this API works on the command line. So all that stuff in black is stuff we've seen before. Um, we're doing a put here, um, adding a new poem called foo, um, sending it to that URL, that uh, API v1 poems that you're very used to. But there's a new bit in red, which is minus minus user, and then it's username colon password in quotes like that, um, and curl will send that as part of the HTTP request. Very simple. Okay, so the other thing that we're going to talk about briefly is HTTP Digest. So HTTP Digest is a way of trying to avoid the problem of passing the username and password in clear text in every request. So instead of that, um, the request contains the username and some credentials which have been hashed so that they're um, not readable. Uh, so your password is not uh, easy to find out while the request is going past. Um, and as part of this, um, part of the HTTP Digest standard, there are provisions to stop people from uh, capturing that uh, those credentials and reusing them, replaying uh, what you did again. Um, so it avoids that problem as well. Um, it does this by uh, hashing the password so that it can't be read. I'm not I'm not totally clear on the details. Uh, the research that I did about this when I was investigating what to use for this API convinced me that HTTP Digest was invented to avoid a problem that I didn't feel I had, which was that uh, it was hard to use HTTPS. Um, uh, it seems now reasonably easy to use HTTPS for any web browser you want to use. So HTTP Basic makes our lives a lot simpler. Um, and so long as we're using HTTPS, no one can listen in on usernames and passwords. So um, uh, my understanding of HTTP Digest is limited because I stopped researching at that point. But basically, um, it, it, you send the credentials with every request, but those credentials are sent in a form which means it's uh, difficult to find out what your password is and difficult to replay um, 
do a replay attack by just sending the same packets again. Uh, it has the same uh, properties as HTTP Basic in terms of being easy to use in a browser and, and hard to make it make the browser forget your username and password. Uh, and using it on the command line is very similar to the other one. Okay, so how we're going to uh, implement this in our Python uh, REST API? Well, let's start off by talking about how authentication is going to work. So this is the layer that finds out who you are and in some cases ensures that you are a logged in someone. Okay, so in a GET request, what we're going to do is call this function authenticate user and then we'll pass on, when, uh, when that authenticate user function returns, we're going to pass on this user object to the rest of our code. So authenticate user is a um, function we've written and here's a bit of it. So basically what it does is this is a web.py way of getting stuff that was in the request. So there's something that's been stuck into the request called HTTP underscore authorization. Confusingly, because we're using it for authentication. Um, and what it gives you back is basically a mangled version of the username and password that won't get screwed up on the way to the server. Not mangled to make it hard to read, just mangled um, so that uh, you can use any characters you want without it screwing up. So... Um, this remember we called this from the get request and the get doesn't mind if you haven't provided a username and password it will still let you through so if auth is none that line in the middle that means uh, the user didn't provide any uh, credentials so that's fine we just return none so the user who you are we, we're returning none in this case which we're using to indicate that you are an anonymous user um, uh, if if the user did provide some credentials well then we're going to extract the username and password um, from those credentials uh, by unmunging them and we've written a function called extract user pw and that returns the username and password which we'll use in a minute so let's have a look at that extract user pw function which we wrote again takes in the uh, the stuff that was stuffed into the request does a tiny bit of regular expression munging just to take strip off the string uh, basic space which is uh, always at the beginning of this string when it comes through then we can use um, a, a Python standard function from the module base64, which uh, is called decode string. And what that does is just unmangle, uh, unmunge that um, username and password um, so that it comes out again as pretty much the string that we gave to curl, which was username colon password. So then in order to get the username and password out of it, we just do that last line. We do a split uh, on a colon and return username and password. Uh, this wouldn't work if the username had a colon in it. Uh, don't know whether that's allowed or not. This is not a uh, production quality implementation. Um, so finishing off that uh, authenticate uh, user function. So now we've got the username and password out from that function we just looked at. We've got this user and this PW, uh, these two objects, uh, two strings. So what we do is we, we check whether this is a user we know about. So we have a list called known users, and at the moment in the program that's just a hard-coded list. So if the user is one of the known users, which means it's in known users, and if the password matches what we've got stored, because this known users list is a map of username to the password, if, so if the user exists, and if the password is correct, then we return um, the name of the user. Otherwise, uh, we throw uh, an exception. You know, we, I've got a little function there uh, which creates an exception, an authorized uh, access exception 401 error. Uh, and that will go back to the user saying, um, please give your username and password. And that, that's what makes the dialog pop up in the browser if you're using, if you're trying to use this in a browser. So if the if the user that you provided all the was didn't exist, all the password is wrong, we'll throw this exception and web.py will turn that into a nice uh, 401 response. Otherwise, we just return a string saying this is who the user is. Um, so that's okay for the get um, method, but what about the post method where um, we don't just want to know who you are if you're logged in, we want to make sure that you definitely are logged in. So here we've got another function called require authenticated user, and require authenticated user calls authenticate user. But if the answer that comes back is none, then it throws an exception. Pretty straightforward. So that's what all the post patch um, delete functions is. Now we've got hold of a username, or it could be none in the case of get, and we can use it. So how we use it uh, is in the authorization there. For only for those actions that um, 
uh, make use of it, um, that care who you are, um, we need to do a piece of authorization. So here's the code for authorization. We've written a function called isValidUser, and at the moment all that does is checks that this string that we got given back is not none. Um, so in theory you could do another, you could do a further check here. If you didn't have so much trust between the different uh, sections of your program, you could be passing around a token that proves that the, um, this person is a valid user. As it is at the moment, we one piece of our program completely trusts the other piece. So once we've got back that string, which is our username, um, when we call other functions that need to do authorization, they just trust that if that string is not none, uh, you are a person. So when we come into the amend poem function, notice by the way that the, the code we were looking at before, the authentication code, was right on the edge of the web web handling code, it was get, post, um, put, all that stuff. Now we're deep in the guts of the program, we're in this function called amend poem, uh, which will be the same for uh, anyone using this API, even if we write a different layer that doesn't even work over the web, um, or, or we're writing the website, which will also be calling these functions, um, all these functions are going to require that this user is, um, is who they should be. So you tend to do authentication right on the outside edge, and you tend to do authorization as deep in as possible in the code that um, really does the work, so that you don't accidentally miss it or anything like that. So amend poem is the function that actually does the work. At the beginning of amend poem, we just check um, that this person is a valid user at all. Now, if we've got to this point using our current code, uh, we already know that uh, this person's a valid user, uh, so we'll never throw this invalid request um, exception. But uh, if some other person was using this API, they might have forgotten to do the authentication. And if they did that, we would throw at this point and say to them, no, you've got to, you've got to provide me with a, a username. And we could, for example, in this isValidUser function, we could test um, that the user is someone who actually is in the list of users. We could redo that test, and that would make it a bit of a stronger test. But the point is, uh, deep in the guts of this code, we know that this user has to be someone uh, has to be a logged in user to do the amend perm action. So we're expressing that in the code. And then a bit further down uh, in the amend perm function, once we've got hold of the document that's going to get modified, um, we've added a new field to this document called contributor, a new property to the doc um, to each poem. So um, you can track the, uh, the code changes if you go and look at the, um, the GitHub repository from the blog post that's linked from the show notes. Um, and we've added a, a new property to a poem called contributor. And what all we do inside a men poem is we get hold of that contributor property and we check whether that contributor is the same username uh, as the username we've been told is making this request. And if not, um, we raise a 403 error, which means uh, permission denied. So we're not saying you, you failed to log in, which would be a 401. We're saying um, you're not allowed to do that action. So that's a 403. Um, and that's how we've implemented really, really basic um, HTTP, basic uh, authentication and a little bit of authorization uh, inside the uh, our poem application API. Um, in future talks, we will be looking at how to uh, do it ourselves and make a security token that means you only have to log in once and after that um, you've got a token stored in a cookie. I might also rant a bit how, about how it's a bit rubbish and there's lots of opportunities to make mistakes, I don't know, we'll see about that. Um, uh, and other than that, uh, if you're interested in uh, finding more videos on all kinds of things like Lisp and how to write your first ever computer program, uh, check out the YouTube page, follow me on Twitter to basically for links to blog posts that I've written and YouTube videos, um, follow my blog for stuff about my open source projects, um, other techy technical stuff and links to the videos. And uh, if you want to look at the, my open source projects, have a look at artificialworlds.net. Somewhere on your screen there ought to be a subscribe button. Click it if you want to find out when the next video comes out. And, uh, thanks for watching, see you next time.